The Irish Coven The three members of the Irish Coven are old friends of Carlisle Cullen's. Siobhan is the leader, but she and her mate Liam trust the judgment of their newest member, Maggie, who has a gift for knowing a lie when she hears one. Liam. Date of birth, around 1615. Date of transformation, 1651, at approximately age 36. Source of transformation, unknown. Place of origin, Ireland. Hair color, dark brown. Eye color, red or black. Height, six foot five. Physical description. Liam is tall and lean with an imposing countenance. Special abilities. He does not possess a quantifiable supernatural ability. Family and coven relationships. Liam's mate is Siobhan. Maggie is the other member of their coven. Personal history. Liam was an Irish warrior who fought in the Irish Rebellion of 1641 and later against Cromwell's reconquest of Ireland. Liam became a vampire through one of the most common types of accidental transformation, battlefield excess. After the Volturi came to power, vampires were unable to kill as recklessly as before, and most were forced to curb their appetites to avoid notice. The circumstances of war, however, gave them an opportunity to kill large numbers of humans at once without attracting attention from either humans or vampires. It became common among nomads to seek out human wars as an opportunity to feast. One of the consequences of this practice was the occasional unplanned transformation. Once a vampire was totally sated, she might continue to drink blood for enjoyment rather than need. In such situations, she might not drain enough blood from her victim to kill him. If she left him in that state without any further violence, he would begin the transformation process. After Liam's conversion was complete, he went through the normal period of newborn behavior. He met Siobhan during his first six months of vampire life. She instructed him on the vampire laws, which kept him from drawing negative attention from the Volturi. Liam was very taken with Siobhan's strength and beauty. They joined forces quickly, though it was never discussed. From the beginning, Siobhan was the coven's leader. When Liam was no longer a newborn, he became selective about his prey. For centuries, he would kill only Englishmen. English soldiers are still his preferred victims. Liam and Siobhan were well aware of the Volturi and their rules and always behaved circumspectly. For Liam, as long as the Volturi did not become corrupted by their power and attempt to control more aspects of vampire life, he had no problem with them. He was born into a world where their laws of mutual convenience were accepted fact, and he did not question them. Liam was not as fascinated as Siobhan by the stories of the Volturi guard's special talents. When Siobhan discovered Maggie, and wanted to try to create her own talented vampire, Liam was opposed. He was concerned that the Volturi would resent the imitation if they found out. More than that, he didn't want to share Siobhan's attention with anyone else. Siobhan transformed Maggie regardless, leaving Liam quite unhappy with her decision. Siobhan pled with him to give Maggie a chance, and he grudgingly agreed. It didn't take long for Liam to see the benefits of having a talented coven member, and over time he became quite fond of Maggie. He learned to consider her a younger sister. Maggie. Date of birth, 1832. Date of transformation, 1847, at age 15. Source of transformation, Siobhan. Place of origin, Ireland. Hair color, red. Eye color, blue when human. Red or black as a vampire. Height, 5 foot 2. Physical description. Maggie is short and very thin and has bright red ringlets. Special abilities. She is able to tell if a person is lying. Family and coven relationships. She is in a coven with Siobhan and Liam. Personal history. Maggie always had difficulty dealing with authority on a parental level and on a community level. The normal, everyday hypocrisy that most people expected was always foreign to her. 
If someone said something that did not correspond with their true feelings, Maggie was instinctively aware of that discrepancy. In those situations, she felt compelled to point out the lie. Though this often led to punishment, sometimes quite severe, she was unable to let the lie pass. Her accuracy made people uncomfortable, and the closer someone was to her, the more uncomfortable she made them. In the mid-1840s, the Great Famine decimated her village. Everyone who could afford to immigrate to America left. This included her family, who had not quite enough to buy passage for every member. Maggie's maternal grandparents, who were already in poor condition, were left behind. Maggie was left ostensibly to care for them as best she could. In reality, as Maggie was well aware, she was sacrificed because her parents did not love her as much as they loved her siblings. She was a trial to them, and they sometimes wondered if her abilities were demonic. Siobhan and Liam found Maggie alone on the road to Cork, nearly dead from starvation. Naturally, when Siobhan questioned Maggie, her answers were the whole truth. After Maggie's transformation, her ability became even more pronounced. A person did not have to speak aloud for Maggie to know if he was behaving in a way contrary to what he believed. If a person misrepresented himself in either appearance or action, she knew. Because Siobhan and Liam were routinely honest with each other and themselves, having Maggie join their coven was not the strain it might have been. It was easier for Maggie to be with them than it would have been otherwise. After her transformation, any kind of deception made her physically uncomfortable. Siobhan. Date of birth, around 1490. Date of transformation, around 1510, at approximately age 20. Source of transformation, Sankar. Place of origin, Ireland. Hair color, black. Eye color, violet blue when human. Red or black as a vampire. Height, 6 foot 2. Physical description. Siobhan is very tall, muscular, and voluptuous, with thick black hair and exceptionally beautiful facial features. Special abilities. Though Siobhan does not believe she has any talent, some suspect she can affect the outcome of a situation through willpower alone. Family and coven relationships. Her mate is Liam, and Maggie is also in her coven. Personal history. Siobhan was the only daughter of a blacksmith and his wife. This made her unusual in a village where most families were very large. She had a strikingly attractive face. Large violet blue eyes surrounded by incredibly long lashes were her dominant feature. She was also known for her perfect fair skin. Aside from these things, however, she was unlike the other village beauties. By the time she was fourteen, she was taller than any other woman in the village. By the time she was sixteen, she was taller than all of the men except for her father. She was also stronger than many of them, as an only child. She had always helped her father at the forge. He died in an accident when she was seventeen, and by then she was strong and knowledgeable enough to take over his craft. This was unheard of, and disapproved of by many. However, it was what she wanted, and the village needed a blacksmith. Eventually, she became an accepted part of village life, and grew famous in the surrounding areas as the big blacksmith girl. Despite her beautiful face and generous hourglass figure, Siobhan did not have any suitors. Her height, strength, and profitable occupation were intimidating to the village men. This did not bother Siobhan, who had no need for a husband. She was able to comfortably support herself and her mother, and she did not want anything else. The physical size and strength that awed the locals, however, brought her the attention of a Turkish vampire named Sankar. Sankar was creating a vampire harem, and he desired unusual women for his collection. Sankar traveled through all of Europe with human servants, seeking the exceptional. He heard of the beautiful Irish woman who was stronger than a man, and sought her out. She was like no one he'd ever seen before and he decided he wanted to add her to his assortment of females. Sankar gave Siobhan no warning or explanation, 
He abducted her in the night, raped her, bit her, and then carried her back to his home while she was still in the painful throes of the conversion process. Sankar had a difficult time dealing with the newborn Siobhan. She was incredibly strong, even for a newborn vampire. She also had no love for Sankar. For a while, he was able to keep her distracted with plenty of blood. But before her first year as a vampire was over, she killed Sankar. She was then forced to destroy the three members of his harem coven who were devoted to him. The four others were not upset by Sankar's demise, and they all went their own ways. Siobhan spent a few years traveling and learning the way vampires lived before she returned to Ireland. She was more widely nomadic for her first century, hunting across most of Europe and Asia. During that time, she met a few members of the Volturi Guard. She was intrigued by the amazing things they were rumored to be capable of, and by the warriors in the bunch. She wondered if she was strong enough to be acceptable, but she never went to the Volturi to be considered. She didn't want to belong to anyone but herself. On one of her return trips to Ireland, she found the newborn Liam. She was attracted to his fierceness and focus, both of which were apparent despite his newborn wildness. She could see that he was totally uneducated, and so she took him under her wing. After they joined forces, they stayed mostly in Ireland. Liam was most comfortable there, though he did travel occasionally with Siobhan. Siobhan and Liam had just finished hunting one night when they came across Maggie. Siobhan was startled when the delirious child accused them of not being human. Intrigued, Siobhan asked her how she knew, and Maggie explained the curse that had led to her abandonment. Siobhan was sure she had discovered one of those special humans who would have an extra ability as a vampire. She was excited to proceed, but Liam was upset. He didn't understand why she would want to add someone to their coven. Weren't they happy as they were? Siobhan overruled him and invited Maggie to join them, promising that she would never be hungry again. Maggie could sense that Siobhan was telling the truth, and that Siobhan did not mean her harm, so she agreed. Siobhan asked Liam to trust her, and he reluctantly agreed to see how things would work out. Siobhan made it clear that Liam was her first priority, and he became reconciled to Maggie's presence more quickly than Siobhan had expected. Siobhan also enjoyed Maggie's company more than she had expected. She felt very maternal toward the girl, and fell naturally into the kind of close relationship she'd had with her own mother. She also enjoyed the advantage of Maggie's talent in any kind of interaction. Maggie learned to control her vocalizations, so she was able to simply nod or shake her head slightly to communicate whether or not someone was being honest. As long as she knew Siobhan was hearing the truth, she was comfortable. While Siobhan was happy with her choice to include Maggie in her coven, she felt no desire to seek out other talented humans. Her curiosity about that world was satisfied. James's Coven James, a tracker who loved the hunt, sought out the company of a few other vampires in order to use their help in his ongoing tracking games. His coven was nomadic. All the members, all of whom are now deceased, drank human blood, as do most vampires, and they spent the majority of their lives outdoors. Because they never made the attempt to blend in with humans, they did not see the need to pay close attention to personal appearance. They looked feral to other vampires and to humans. James. Date of birth, around 1780. Date of transformation, around 1805, at approximately age 25. Source of transformation, a French vampire. Place of origin, present-day northwestern Pennsylvania, near Lake Erie. Hair color, light brown. Eye color, red or black. Height, 5 foot 10. Physical description. With an average build and nondescript features, James was not as beautiful as most vampires. Special abilities. He was a skilled tracker, able to sense in advance the most likely moves of his prey. Family and coven relationships. His mate was Victoria. Laurent also traveled in his coven for a short while. Personal history. James was born near the end of the American Revolution. His father was a French trapper, and his mother was an English girl who had come to the Americas 
as an indentured servant and subsequently ran away from her master. They lived a nomadic lifestyle, spending most of their time on the trail and occasionally returning to Montreal or Pittsburgh to trade. James was raised to track and trap, and he learned quickly. The Iroquois killed his parents before his eleventh birthday, but already his skills were developed enough that he was able to survive on his own. He gained a measure of fame during his late teens and early twenties as the best tracker on the frontier, as well as sometimes being called the ugliest. He didn't care about his face, all he cared about was winning. He was boastful about his prowess and always up for a challenge. He won all contests of skill until one night in Montreal, when he met a mysterious Frenchman, also claiming to be a tracker, who found James's confidence amusing. The Frenchman offered to best him at any test, his only condition being that the competition had to be at night. James was unimpressed by the dandified appearance of his competitor, and he agreed without hesitation, even when the Frenchman, seemingly in jest, upped the stakes to life or death. James's test was to release a marked deer into the wild, allow it an hour to run or hide, and then track it. Of course, the Frenchman found the deer in a matter of minutes. He returned the carcass to James, who had just begun his search, and reminded James that his life was forfeit. James, who had witnessed the speed with which the Frenchman moved, and also saw no evidence of traditional hunting methods on the deer's body, cried Fowl. He said the Frenchman obviously had an undisclosed advantage, perhaps witchcraft or demonic help. If James were given the same advantage, he was sure he could beat the Frenchman. The French vampire was entertained by James's brash confidence. He agreed to give James the exact advantage he himself had thinking it a good joke to end the bet by taking James's life in a different way. He bit James and left, laughing, offering a rematch in a decade or so. James adjusted to vampire life fairly easily. He was quite pleased with his heightened abilities and surprised that he was no longer considered ugly. But that didn't soften him toward the Frenchman. It was only about six months after the newborn madness had faded when he found the French vampire and killed him. James's idea of winning the bet. Being a vampire made normal tracking, James's lifelong pursuit, somewhat boring. His senses were so developed that it was child's play to track any animal or human. To liven things up, James began giving himself harder and harder challenges. He would pick someone on a crowded city street, allow himself one sniff, and then walk away from the chase for a week or a month. Then he would return to the scene and track that individual. When that became too easy, he would do the same thing on a crowded dock, follow the ship a few months later, and search for his victim in another country. Sometimes these hunts took years, but James always found his prey. Because of his success, this got boring too. He looked for bigger challenges, and began moving away from the practice of trapping for food. Instead, he tracked vampires, a more worthy prey. This practice nearly cost him his life a few times when he'd killed one member of a coven and then been set upon by vengeful remnants. These dangerous experiences did not stop him. He enjoyed the escalated consequences of this game. James met Victoria in England while playing this game. He caught the vampire scent, and though he had no idea whom he was tracking, he tried to hunt her down. It was the longest hunt he ever embarked on. No matter how fast he moved, she was one step ahead. He realized quickly that she somehow knew he was after her, though she'd had no warning. He got close enough a few times to catch glimpses of the beautiful redhead, but she always escaped. After a few years of endless chasing, James was intrigued. He knew his tracking abilities went beyond just having excellent senses. He had a gift. He could predict his prey's moves in advance. But this vampire seemed to have a similar ability to know his own plans. He no longer wanted to kill the vampire, he wanted to learn more about her. Unbeknownst to him, the less he meant her actual harm, the less effective her own skill became. She could feel the shift, 
and eventually allowed him to catch up with her in a place she'd chosen for an easy escape route, just in case. She was also curious about this dogged pursuer who could somehow always find her trail again. There was an immediate attraction between the two. They teamed up for more reasons than attraction, however. Victoria's super-developed sense of self-preservation made teaming up with such a lethal vampire look promising. James knew his ongoing search for the next big challenge was only going to get him into more dangerous circumstances as time went on. Joining forces with a vampire so good at escaping would be a definite benefit. After a time, Victoria was totally bound to him. He was her mate. However, James was never as committed to the relationship. His own desires were always more important to him than Victoria was. James did not view Victoria's survival as a failure, because he had found her and, in a way, claimed her life. He considered Alice Cullen his only failure. While pursuing a different hunt, James came across Alice's scent. She was what the Voltori call a singer for James. The scent was very old, but James had tracked older. So, not abandoning his other hunt, James paused for a snack. Victoria, always the cautious one, was the first to be aware of the other vampire involved when James found the asylum where Alice had been incarcerated. She made James pause to get the lay of the land, thinking there might be more than one vampire. Possibly this area was their hunting land, and the asylum their headquarters. James never truly forgave her for making him hesitate in light of what happened. The second James caught her scent, Alice saw a vision of him coming to kill her. She confided in her only friend, the vampire who worked nights in the asylum. The vampire knew Alice was special and cared about her like a daughter. He decided to save her from James, but, he, but she foresaw failure after failure, and he started to realize what he was up against. He stole her from the asylum and hid her as well as he could, fighting her before he left her alone. He went back to try to delay James, knowing he was no match for the strong tracker, but hoping to give Alice the time she had foreseen might be enough to keep her alive. James easily overpowered the older vampire. As a precaution, Victoria questioned the old one, using rather extreme measures to extract all information about Alice and anyone else involved. James found the vampire's concern for Alice and interest in her baffling but intriguing. He paid attention to the story until he found out that the old one had bitten Alice. He left Victoria with the still-living vampire and continued on to his prize. He was disappointed to find Alice clearly in the last throes of the vampire conversion, though she made no sound, an after-effect of the shock treatments. All of her blood had been changed by the transformation, and there was no satisfying snack to be had. Alice was totally vulnerable, too lost in the pain of the process to even notice James's presence. He watched her wake and scramble away to look for blood in the typical newborn fashion. He wondered if she would be special as the old one believed. He decided to give her time to develop into a worthy adversary, though she looked too tiny and weak to give him much hope. Irritated by the loss of her blood, he returned and destroyed the old vampire. As James grew more and more ambitious in his games, Victoria grew more cautious. She was the one who suggested teaming up with expendable allies just for the sake of numbers. They did this successfully a few times, letting the additions act as the canary in the mine during potentially dangerous situations, cannon fodder in others. Laurent was wilier and more skilled than some others James and Victoria had chosen, so he lasted longer. He enjoyed the novelty of James's lifestyle. They all worked together easily through a couple of uneventful hunts. James and Victoria heard rumors of large clans of vampires claiming areas in the Pacific Northwest and James was attracted to the rumors of these unusually large covens. Victoria was wary. She wanted to find more backup, but James didn't want to waste time. He thought Laurent was more than enough. James had no immediate objective in mind when they first met the Cullens. This was just an information-gathering trip. He let Laurent lead the way, so if the coven was hostile, Laurent would be their first priority. James was shocked and then thrilled by Bella's presence and Edward's protectiveness. There was a hunt that would combine the best of both worlds. A delicious prize, though Bella was not a singer for James, she smelled much sweeter than the average human, and a huge coven bent on protecting her. 
He was determined to get to the prize before she was ruined, as Alice had been. The surprise of seeing Alice there only fueled this desire to win at last. He hoped that as they had not turned the girl so far, they had a reason for not acting, but he couldn't be sure. James was furious when he learned of Laurent's defection, but in his hurry to get Bella before someone thought to change her, he postponed vengeance until after the hunt. The hunt proved to be a huge disappointment. Rather than keeping Bella physically under his protection, as James would have preferred, Edward opted to try misdirection. Following his hunches, James wound up in the same city as Bella, and then struck upon a successful lure to separate her from the vampires. He was hopeful, however, that Edward and his family's search for revenge would prove more exciting. He lied to Bella just once in the dance studio. Of Alice, he said, so I guess her cousin ought to be able to derive some comfort from this experience. I get you, but they get her. In fact, he had no intention of letting Alice live. Now that Alice was able to care for herself and had the support of a strong coven, James planned to finish that hunt, too. Laurent, date of birth, 1700s, date of transformation, 1740s, at approximately age 40. Source of transformation, Boris. Place of origin, Paris, France. Hair color, black. Eye color, red or black. Height, 5 foot 9. Physical description, Laurent had glossy black hair and pale skin with a slight olive tone. He had a medium, slightly muscular frame and an easy smile. Special abilities. He did not possess a quantifiable supernatural ability. Family and coven relationships. He was once part of a coven with James and Victoria. He later formed an attachment to Irina and Denali. Personal history. Laurent was born into an aristocratic but financially embarrassed family during the reign of King Louis XIV. He was the third son, and he had little in the way of prospects. Thanks to his older brother's marriage into a more prosperous family, Laurent was recommended for a minor position in the court of the Sun King. Laurent loved being a part of the court and had ambitions to rise. He was always attracted to people with power and curried their favor. He had a knack for discerning who the most important person was in any given grouping, and then attaching himself to that person. There was a certain way about Laurent that made anyone he singled out feel more important, so he did well among the aristocrats and had a promising future. His life changed when a mysterious ambassador purportedly from the Romanov court in Russia made a dipl diplomatic visit to the French court. The ambassador's strange behavior was attributed to cultural di differences. He came out of his quarters only at night, kept a retinue of mute servants and soldiers who were totally obedient, and always put off discussions of matter of state. He did not seem to enjoy the entertainments of the French court immensely, and was very interested in King Louis's art collection. Laurent was irresistibly drawn to the Russian ambassador, who seemed to Laurent to exude true power more even than the king himself. The Russian ambassador had no fear of any man. The ambassador, a fun-loving Russian vampire named Boris, who enjoyed human revelry, was flattered by the eager and admiring Laurent. He struck up a friendship with the French boy. When it was time for the Russian ambassador to leave, the number of vanished serving men and women was beginning to alarm many, he invited Laurent to go with him. Laurent's love of the powerful made this an easy decision, his instincts told him that Boris was more powerful than anyone he'd ever met. Boris and Laurent became so close that eventually Boris told Laurent the truth about himself. Laurent begged to have the gift of power and immortality for himself. Boris was happy to comply. For a while, Boris and Laurent were companions, but Laurent quickly grew tired of Boris's jovial habits. Once Laurent was introduced to the vampire world, it was clear to him that there were others much more powerful than Boris. The next relationship that changed Laurent's life was with Vladimir, one of the surviving Romanians. Vladimir still radiated some of the power he had once held, and Laurent's reaction to that power was predictable. He did not follow Vladimir long. Stefan was opposed to adding any new vampires to their number, favoring mobility and secrecy over everything else. But it was long enough. When he at last came in contact with the Voltorian, he was already tainted. 
the Volturi were the epitome of vampire power, exactly the kind of vampires Laurent wanted to be with. But when he was brought to Aro as a prospective lesser guard applicant, Aro saw the brief encounter with the Romanians and sent him away as untrustworthy. Laurent was aware that members of the Volturi followed him for a few decades, hoping he would lead them to Vladimir. Laurent always hoped that someday he would get another chance to join the Volturi. He wandered the world, allying himself with anyone who seemed to have power until he found someone more powerful. In this way, he joined James and Victoria. James's aura of invincibility was very attractive to Laurent. Another change occurred in Laurent's life when he, James, and Victoria clashed with the Cohens. His instincts told him that he was on the wrong side of that conflict, and he quickly jumped ship to ingratiate himself with the Cullens by warning them about James. Laurent was confused by Carlisle, who had a very different kind of authority than he was used to. He was happy to stay out of the way until James was no longer an issue, hoping to study Carlisle's strength later. The Denali sisters proved an interesting distraction. Tanya had a similar kind of influence as Carlisle. Laurent let their peaceful life envelop him for a short while and enjoyed a passing flirtation with Irina, though he did not take it as seriously as she did. When Victoria sought him out, and after he was sure she was not there to kill him, he was seduced anew by the old kind of command. He decided to keep the lines of communication open with her and do her one favor she asked of him. Victoria. Date of birth, 1550s. Date of transformation, late 1560s, at approximately age 18. Source of transformation, Anne, her sister. Place of origin, England. Hair color, brilliant orange. Eye color, green when human, red or black as a vampire. Height, 5 foot 6. Physical description. Victoria had a feline quality in the way she moved. Her eyes were fierce, and her orange hair was long and tousled giving it the appearance of a flame. Her voice was unusually high-pitched, like that of a child. Special abilities. She was exceptionally good at evading enemies. Family and coven relationships. She was James's mate, and after his death, she created her own coven of newborns. Personal history. Victoria was born in London in the mid-16th century. Her mother was a scullery maid, and her father was the master of the house. Victoria was the second illegitimate child after her sister Anne. They were raised as servants and worked hard from early childhood. Neither of them had much in the way of education. Anne had the misfortune of being quite pretty, with mahogany hair and a cream and rose complexion. Like her mother, Anne was subject subjected to the attention of the men of the house beginning early in her adolescence. Victoria, on the other hand, had bright red hair, freckles, and eyes a shade of green that people called witchy. Though her features were actually quite fine, she was still thought of as ill-favored. Eventually, the sisters were able to get jobs together in a very fine establishment. Anne as a lady's maid, Victoria as a kitchen drudge. The master of the house was not a kind man, quick to beat a servant for any perceived fault, and lecherous as well. Both sisters, along with the other help, grew adept at disappearing whenever possible. With her shockingly bright hair, it was more difficult for Victoria to avoid notice than most, and she received extra beatings simply for being visible. She grew better at hiding, but when the master did catch her, he seemed irritated that she'd evaded him for so long, and was more vicious in his punishments. Though the jobs kept them fed, the sisters decided to flee when Victoria was twelve. Anne was very fond of her sister, and feared for her life. It proved to be a bad decision. Without references, the girls were unable to find employment. They had no food and no shelter, and the cold season was coming. Anne finally agreed to work for a local pimp on the condition that her sister could have a free lodging with the other working girls. This situation was worse for Anne and nearly as bad for Victoria as the house they'd run from. However, it was better than the streets of London. Thanks to the heavy-handed pimp, Victoria perfected her ability to disappear, despite her hair. One night, Anne went out to find a client and never came home. Victoria was heartbroken. The pimp, angry at losing one girl, was determined that the remaining sister would earn her way. The pimp kept her virtually a prisoner while she learned her place. 
With her ability to escape, however, it wasn't long before she broke free. This put her back in the cold. To keep from freezing or starving, she became a kind of cat burglar, sneaking into houses at night, curling up in small hidden places to sleep, and stealing as little food as possible to keep her theft from being noticed. She moved from house to house, leaving no trace of her existence. Even dogs did not react to her presence. When she was 15, she was able to get a real job again. Having overheard the firing of a scullery maid, she presented herself at the opportune time, and her lack of references was overlooked. It was hard work, but stable, and she was not hit often. She was content with her position for the most part. Trouble didn't start again until the pimp spotted her one day, buying groceries, and tried to follow her home. She evaded him easily, but she realized that now that he knew she was alive, he would keep looking. She thought of leaving the city, but she wasn't sure she could make a living in the country. It was at that time that Anne found her. Victoria woke in the night to see Anne in her tiny attic room, standing over her. Anne was more beautiful than ever, though she'd lost all the pink in her cheeks. Victoria was ecstatic to see her sister alive and wanted to embrace her, but Anne kept her distance, moving at a speed that shocked and silenced Victoria. Anne wanted to know if Victoria was happy and safe. Slowly, at first, Victoria began to answer all of Anne's questions. Anne was not satisfied with Victoria's predicament. She pondered aloud, killing the pimp, but decided he was only a small part of the problem. Victoria would never be safe until she was stronger than those who would hurt or control her. Anne asked Victoria if she would trust Anne's judgment. Victoria agreed. Anne picked Victoria up as if she were a doll and carried her out of the attic window. Apologizing first, Anne bit her sister. When Victoria revived from the transformation, she found herself in a beautiful country house, surrounded by four of the most beautiful women she had ever seen, including her sister. The other three were named Hilda, Mary, and Heidi, Heidi being by far the most beautiful of them all. Anne explained that Hilda, a nomadic German vampire, had saved her from her hard life out of pity, and then allowed her to go back for Victoria when she was able. The women all with pasts similar to Anne's, were strong enough now to live as they wished, free from fear and abuse. For a short while, Victoria was perfectly happy. The coven of women coexisted easily, because none of them craved power or authority. Two years after Victoria joined them, Hilda rescued another woman, Noella, who caught her fancy in the streets of Lisbon. When Noella was still a newborn, the coven received a visit from the Voltori, led by Aro himself. With them were Caius, Jane, Chelsea, and a few more physical guards. Caius accused them of attracting too much human notice with their big coven of young, unruly newborns. Hilda defended her coven, maintaining that they never introduced more than one newborn at a time to be sure she could control them. Aro asked for evidence. Hilda agreed to prove her case with a handshake. After reading all her thoughts, Aro sadly, sadly claimed that the coven was guilty. Hilda angrily accused him of lying, and was immediately slaughtered by the guards. Jane inflicted pain on each of the others in quick succession, halting their instinctive attack. Aro wanted to know if anyone was willing to live by the law, or would they all have to be destroyed? Almost as if in a dream, Heidi got to her feet and moved forward. Aro smiled and welcomed her, while her former coven mates watched in shock. Victoria did not understand any of what she was watching but she sensed that she and her sister were about to die whether they surrendered or not. She screamed for the others to run. Anne, Mary, and Noella all scattered in different directions than the other ones she took. Victoria was surprised when Jane did not attack again, not knowing that the Volturi guard enjoyed a good chase. Anne, Mary, and Noella were all quickly caught and dispatched. None of the Volturi worried much when the red-headed girl proved impossible to find. She was unimportant could deal with her some other time. For now, Aro was happy to go home with his prize. That was the end of Victoria's peaceful vampire life. Now suspicious of other vampires, she avoided, she avoided them all. With her gift, it was not difficult until James. In James, she found someone who was honest in his intentions and confident in his abilities. She was attracted to his gift, which was like a mirror of her own. Eventually, she fell in love with his self-assurance. It felt safe to her, 
stable in an odd way. She was never aware that his feelings did not entirely reflect her own. While she was happier with James, her life definitely was not peaceful or easy. The way he liked to live constantly put her into situations that on her own she would have avoided. When the Cullens killed James, Victoria lost her mate and her stability. She felt vulnerable. She quickly created a companion, choosing a strong young human man. She made sure Riley was totally loyal to her, and was surprised at how readily he believed she changed him out of love. Then she made more vampires, feeling that if she could surround herself with allies, she would be safe. At the same time, she hid herself from these new allies, aside from Riley. She was extremely paranoid for a time, setting up layers of protection for herself. She was loosely copying what she'd seen with the Voltori guard, but waiting for her newborns to be old enough to train. In the meantime, she had Riley control them with carefully constructed lies, most notably the myth that vampires were destroyed by the sun. In the first six months after James's death, Victoria created 15 newborns and killed roughly four humans to every one that survived as a vampire. One of the first was Diego. One of the last of this period was Raul. Fred was also created during this period. About half of this first wave did not survive during Victoria's absence. Victoria's gift forewarned her when Edward was hunting her, just as it had with James. She left Riley behind to mind the other newborns she'd created. Passing through Texas, Victoria ran up against a territorial coven with a small force of newborns. Victoria had no interest in a pitched battle over land and escaped easily. The encounter gave her new ideas for her newborns, though. When she was sure she'd thrown Edward off her trail, she headed back to the Pacific Northwest. Victoria had not tried to avenge Anne. It wasn't in her nature to choose to put herself in danger. However, her time with James had changed her in some ways. She was able to take slightly greater risks now. The newborns in Texas had inspired her to think beyond just protecting herself, to actively repaying Edward for what he'd done to her. Her plans in regard to the newborns shifted. They were no longer to be a guard for her, but an army. The more plans she put into motion, she thought, the more likely one of them would succeed. The newborns were one option, but one that, were she to use them that way, would require more of a head-on confrontation than she was totally comfortable with. Another of her plans included Laurent. She traced him to Alaska, and, feigning friendship like James, Victoria had not forgiven the defection, she was able to glean all the information he'd learned about the Cullens from the Denali's. She asked him to do her a favor, visit the Cullens and see if they were all still with the girl. It was a win-win for Victoria. If Edward was back in Forks, she assumed he would kill Laurent when he saw the connection to Victoria in Laurent's head. If not, Laurent would bring back news of the girl's location and how many protected her. Meanwhile, she created more newborns, leaving them under Riley's care in case she ended up having to go through the full coven to get the girl. After thinking carefully about Alice and her gift, Victoria put Riley in charge of making all the decisions about the newborn's movements. She made no plans to use the newborns for anything concrete. In fact, she thought about them as little as possible. Laurent called Victoria once to report that the Cullen house was empty, and he would look around to see if the girl had gone with them. She heard nothing more from Laurent. Very carefully, she went to investigate and discovered the wolves. This was an unforeseen problem. James had tracked a werewolf once for the challenge of it. He'd been successful as usual, but werewolves were supposed to be nearly extinct, not traveling in large packs, nor should they be able to maintain their wolf forms in the daylight. This was worrying, but secondary to the fact that Victoria had crossed a fresh trail left by the girl. The Cullens were gone, and all she had to do was get past the werewolves to find the girl totally alone. This proved frustrating. With Victoria's powerful self-preservation instincts, it was nearly impossible for her to physically make a bold move. The wolves were able to drive her off again and again. She was patient, for she thought she had plenty of time. In one not night, she caught Alice's scent and knew her hopes for an easy kill were over. Riley and the newborns became her first priority. She created more and more of them until Seattle was nearly overrun. Meanwhile, she continued making feints to the area around the forks, gathering information and hoping that the Cullens would believe these fruitless attacks were all she had up her sleeve. 